listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm your host, Adam Sokol, and today's guest is Matt Singer, author of the brand new book, Opposable Thumbs, How Siskel and Ebert Changed Movies Forever. Uh, Matt is very, very well known for his incredible film reviews for Screen Crush, and this discussion was just so nerdy and joyful. Uh, Matt's, you know, it would be very fair to say that Matt's passion is, in fact, Siskel and Ebert, but we get a little bit broader than that and talk about the general idea of movies because that is exactly what Matt lives and breathes every single day. He writes film reviews as part of his job. He writes about movies. He ingests movies. He is a movie and film nerd and buff. We talk about the movies that we both loved of our childhood. We joke about some of our favorite directors and, and just a myriad of other things. So it was really, really fun. It was very much like yes anding each other, getting to have uh, a little bit of uh, sketch comedy in this discussion. You're going to adore Opposable Thumbs. I know I've done a couple of nonfiction books in a row here, but Siskel and Eber is, you know, they are two people that truly, truly did change the way that we look at movies, that we discover movies, you know, the whole two thumbs up thing is something that we still use today. And that's, that was something they created. And their relationship was a little bit messy. It was very interesting. They started out really well known separate and didn't really love each other all that much at the beginning, but they became fast friends. And uh, their, their life stories combined between the two of them is just very, very fascinating. So I think you're going to really, really love this particular book. Uh, Speaking of books I enjoyed, I finished one recently that this time is not thematically connected to this particular episode, but just finished it, wanted to talk about it. It came out a few years ago, Uh, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane by Lisa C. Anyone who has followed me for any amount of time knows that I adore Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. And this story is uh, sort of similar thematically. It is uh, a story of two women separated by circumstance, culture, and distance, and the enduring connection between between mothers and daughters. Uh, the, the story opens in this remote Chinese mountain village and our main character and her family, uh, their life very much revolves around tea, the farming of tea, the selling of tea. And they are really, really ensconced in the ritual and routine and traditions of their people. So much so that initially I, I did not know what time frame this, this book was was set in just because I didn't even notice it on the first pages. It felt like it was set hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, It is not. It is much closer to present day. And in fact, our main character kind of grows up and has uh, life experiences that connect her to the modern day world that we are much more familiar with. And she, it's the story of her life. It's the story of her having a family and needing to fight to keep that family and her experiences going through her educational life and then the the life as an adult that she lives. Really interesting, very, very saga-esque. It kind of tells the story of multiple generations of this family. And so I really think you'll like it. It's the tea girl of Hummingbird Lane. Again, if you are very into kind of family dramas and family sagas, highly recommend this book. And I absolutely highly recommend Opposable Thumbs by Matt Singer. It's a wonderful, wonderful story of Siskel and Ebert. If you want to get a hold of me, you can, of course, always reach me at passionsandprologues at gmail.com. You can also find me on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube at Passions and Prologues as well. Uh, One last thing I just want to give a quick call out to before I go. I'm going to be talking about this uh, a fair amount in the coming months, so I apologize in advance. But I am running the Boston Marathon this spring. People who have, again, followed me for any amount of time know that distance running is one of my deep passions. And I'm very, very honored to get to run this particular race. It has been something on my bucket list for a long time. Part of running the Boston Marathon for my journey is supporting the Boston Medical Center. I'm trying to raise $12,000 for the Boston Medical Center. They are truly, truly an incredible charity. They're dedicated to providing exceptional care to patients as well as families. And it's something that every single donation helps them to improve healthcare access, advancing medical research, 
and just the overall well-being of their patients and families. So I'll put a link in uh, in the show notes here. If you have a few bucks, you can donate. Again, I'm trying to raise $12,000. I, I have a few months to do it, but I would deeply appreciate it if, if you're able to do that. And if not, if you can just share the page with others who might be able to, that would be wonderful too. Okay. It's a lot of housekeeping. I appreciate your patience. I am so excited for you to take a listen to this conversation with Matt Singer, author of Opposable Thumbs, um, Passions and Prologues. Okay, Matt, what is something you are super passionate about that we are going to be discussing today? Well, as shocking as this may seem based on the book I've written, I am certainly very passionate about about movies, the world of movies. Yeah, and yeah, we'll, when we'll get into the the book in just a little bit, but obviously, in addition to writing about Cisco and Ebert, you also are an editor and critic at Screen Crush, and you are you you live and breathe movies. So let's let's start at the beginning though. Do you remember like what was either the first movie when you were a kid that kind of captured your attention or, or gave you that feeling where you're like, oh my god, what 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 is going on here? What is this thing? I don't know what the what the first movie necessarily was, but when I look back at that period, the movies that I remember watching the most were things like Spaceballs, things like Ghostbusters, very goofy comedies was certainly the first sorts of movies that I really loved. I mean, also, yeah, I was into Star Wars mm-hmm. or, you know, all the things I, you know, I was born in 1980. So all the things you would imagine a child of the 80s would be into, I was into those things. I, I always thought I was, you know, the biggest dork about Star <laughs> Wars or whatever it was. And then later, you know, now I look around and I go, oh, actually, I I wasn't as crazy about Star Wars as I thought. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, but the the movies that I would watch endlessly and have vivid memories of watching at that age. Yeah, where it was it was comedies. It was your Ghostbusters, your Spaceballs, your your airplanes, your naked guns, mm-hmm. you know, your Wayne's Worlds. I you know, I have two kids now, one of one of whom is is, you know, the older one is almost eight. And, you know, I look at her and her sense of humor which is the dumber, the sillier, the grosser, the better. And I, I, you know, it's genetics are real. They really, you know, that I cannot deny that that is my kid because yeah. there's nothing she loves more than watching a movie where somebody gets hit in the, in the groin. That <laughs> is pure cinema to her. Yeah, no, it's, it's so funny how like the, the types of movies and like, you know, everyone always talks about whatever Saturday Night Live crew you grew up with is always going to be your favorite, but I feel like it's the same thing with like the types of movies. You're, I'm I'm just a few years younger than you, so very much the same thing. You mentioned like Spaceballs, and stuff, but also like Dumb and Dumber and Tommy Boy. And so, like even though that's what I would say is like very high end, like the best possible version of slapstick humor, it is still very much like you said. I will never not laugh at watching somebody fall down a flight of stairs once I know they're okay. And yeah, it's uh, you know, I think it's a safe space. The, the world is really hard and shitty sometimes it's funny to watch someone get get kicked in the groin i think that's okay yeah no i i completely agree and yeah I'm, i guess i'm a couple years older but i mean i was watching you know these movies i mentioned were the ones that i was watching on home video you know i was watching mm-hmm. them on vhs tapes most of them you know recorded off of uh hbo or cable or something yeah. but yeah i saw all those movies you mentioned i was i went to this i was going to the theater those were the movies that i was you know the first movies i was paying to see with my allowance or maybe mm-hmm. my parents would take me to some of them or go with friends, with their parents. Yeah, I had a very intense, you know, you mentioned Dumb and Dumber. I had a very intense relationship with Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. His early films, those were, yes, oh my goodness. Uh, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. That was a film that once upon a time, uh, you know, within the, the, f- the first couple of years after the, the movie came out, like I had seen it so many times, I could almost enact it as like mm-hmm. a one man show. I could recite every line, every, you know, I could imitate. The, it was, the, it was frankly embarrassing. You look back on her now and you're like, can you imagine my parents having to endure just the absolute obnoxiousness and nonsense that I was spewing at them all the time? Or my friends, if I had any friends that I was uh, doing this to. But uh, I did it. It's not there's no point in not, you know, pretending or lying now. It's the truth. That's who I was. 
No, listen, my, my brother is a few years older than me and like we were best friends growing up. We still are. And I know he listens to this, so he's, he'll probably be laughing at this, but like we still like we'll, with our group of friends, we'll still text each other like quotes from Monty Python, like Holy Grail. Sure. Or, yeah, we will absolutely like unequivocally still do those things. And like literally I've mentioned Tommy Boy before, like anytime I'm having a bad day, I will like when he at the very end of it, when he's like he's sitting on the bench and it snaps and he's just like could have done without that. Like I will just still say that to no one and I will laugh as if it's the first time I've heard it. But um, I will say like, I, I still remember vividly being like getting to just the right age where my mom could drop me off at the movie theater. And you felt very like grown up. Like I, I remember going to see in the summer, like gladiator or like, it was a really big deal when um, I think it was Batman and Robin. Like basically I think of all the movies that had like McDonald's or Burger King, like partnerships, like those all became sure. really big like things. So do you remember like, kind of those movies the ones where you were like oh this is an event i have to go see this in the theater uh, um the first movie i can think of in that vein would be 89 batman i mean mm. i can remember the you know and i was already a comic but I mean, really before i was a movie lover like a, a movie nerd mm-hmm. beyond watching just dumb comedies i was a comic book fan that was really my first obsession as yeah. a kid and so i was already sort of primed for any sort of superhero movie but i remember just the the insanity around the 89 batman it was mm-hmm. unbelievable the amount i you know i remember kids at school at elementary school were getting the batman logo shaved into their head the yeah. back of their head i knew a kid who had the batman logo Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I mean, it, that that's a ridiculous thing to do at any time. But now that superhero movies are so central to the culture, you know, pop mm-hmm. culture and movie world, it seems slightly less deranged. At that mm-hmm. time, like I said, I was obsessed with comics, but I didn't talk about it. You know, I didn't yeah. tell my friends I read comics. This was a secret shame that I hid mm-hmm. from the world. So the fact that people were really jazzed about Batman that movie felt like a big deal. And I do have vivid memories of my dad took me to see it. We went to the Brunswick square mall to a movie theater that doesn't, there's still a movie theater there, but it's not the same. They like totally redid it. So I don't count it as the real thing. And I remember we showed up and I remember vividly remember they had in the lobby, a display case of like comic books and stuff. And I remember being transfixed by it and not wanting to, I was so into it. I I didn't want to even go into the theater. And I remember they had, (laughs) A copy of the Batman storyline, A Death in the Family, which Mm -hmm. is the storyline where uh, Jason Todd, the uh, the second Robin, not the original Robin, that was Dick Grayson, but the the second Robin, Jason Todd, he was killed by the Joker. And I didn't know anything about this. I, you know, I was, you know, I was. I guess probably eight, I think eight or nine. And so I just knew Robin as Robin. I didn't, I wasn't a regular reader. I was sort of the kid who was begging for comics when, when you go to the supermarket, you know, or watching Mm -hmm. cartoons hadn't really reached that fanatically reading every month stage yet. Mm -hmm. So I just remember being like, wait, what Robin is dead. They're killing Robin. Is he going to, and I remember my dad having to be like, dude, the movie is starting. We have to go in now. We have to go in. And like he was dra- he was dragging me away to get into the movie. And the and, and the opening credits had already started the famous, you know, the opening where it's going through the Batman logo with the uh, Danny Elfman score was yeah. already playing by the time we sat down in the back of the theater. So, yeah, that that would be the first one I can remember as being a big event Mm -hmm. and then of course you get a little older and then you start to realize yeah these events can often be manufactured hype and they are terrible and i have we could talk about that too that i remember you know the the first movie that i really remember being an event and then going to and thinking this is garbage was um i think it's the 98 godzilla godzilla oh the I, american I, okay. I didn't want to cut you off but i was like he's gonna say the matthew broderick godzilla yeah which was that was you know another massive hyped you know i don't know what it definitely had some sort of fast food tie-in maybe was it taco bell i don't know well, almost I, certainly taco bell <laughs> yeah it had a tie-in it had tons of advertising marketing cross promotion it was you know it's the american godzilla is a huge deal and then and I bought in. I was there. You know, now I'm, you know, probably 17, I would guess, at the summer of 98. And I was like, this, and from from very early on in the movie, you're like, oh, this is terrible. This is yeah. junk. This is, this stinks. And that was the really the first one I remember of those big event movies where I was like, 
oh, they could lie. They could say this is a big deal, but that's actually not a big deal. It is bad. And, uh, you know, you have to become savvy about about the marketing and how they kind of mm -hmm. they drum up that level of attention to get you into the theater. Yeah. Yeah. First off, can't let it go about that. Incredible Professor Frank, by the way, just phenomenal. Oh, that that's just my actual speaking voice. That's I how I, I'm I work very hard to sound like a normal person, but uh thank you, I guess. Fantastic. Um, no, I, I know what you mean because like back when we were kids, like obviously, <clears throat> you know, you could in theory, I guess, find reviews of things, but and this will get into a little bit about opposable thumbs, your book about Siskel and Eber. Like, yes, you could find reviews of places, but like really it was like I I was joking about Batman and Robin, but um, I had an uncle who like helped manage a bunch of McDonald's. And so we would get the like what they claimed to be collector's items, toys and stuff. Yeah. And for the longest time, my parents still had the like Batman and Robin glassware that you could get. Ooh, from nice. Cool. Yeah. We also had the Flintstones ones, which like. The yeah. Ones, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I definitely like, I definitely had uh, the, the rib. I think, well, this is Batman forever. But I definitely had the Riddler's glass mm -hmm. cup. Again, Jim Carrey. Yeah. I had the Riddler's glass cup uh, for sure. Um, yeah. So yes, I know. I know all about. The, yes, I would. I would fixate on those things as yeah. well. I didn't have the connections that you had apparently in the fast food industry. Listen. I'm a little jealous about that. But I, uh, did we have the Transformers that turned in from fries to a? Oh, little, yeah. Wow. Maybe maybe we did. I don't want to brag. Wow. But, wow. But, okay. Um, this is all to say, like, like you said, it would, it was obviously much easier. I don't want to say much easier, but they could, if they had enough money, they could make a marketing campaign where I was like, Hey, you should go see this. It's the, it's the event of the summer. But like, how did you go from being a movie lover to being like, this is something I genuinely don't know. Obviously you, you know, you've written a number of books, but like the, the thing that people likely know you from is, is you are a critic. You also review films. So like, how does one get into that world? Like Siskel and Ebert made it a thing people know about, but like, how did you go from, man, I really love movies to like, I want to make talking about and writing about them my my career? Well, it, I mean, a lot of it had to do with Siskel and Ebert, um, yeah. honestly. I mean, that was the thing that really turned me from the kid who liked watching dumb, silly comedies into someone who was like, wow, movies are interesting. They're exciting. They're, you know... They're enlightening. Mm -hmm. Their art. Um, that show was the thing that was was you know like kind of the light bulb going off. And I grew up in uh, suburban New Jersey, so it was sometimes tough to see the movies that they were talking about um, if they weren't the Batman's and Godzillas of the world. Because I you know there wasn't a ton of of art house theaters uh, at the time. You would have to sort of. And you're right. It was a different era. You know, like if they talked about a movie, a little a foreign film, an art house film that sounded really interesting, you would have to like write it down and hope mm -hmm. that when it came out on VHS that the local blockbuster carried more than like one copy so that the week it came out, you could maybe rent it, you know, or you would show up to blockbuster and it would, they would have one copy and it'd be like, Oh, yeah. somebody took it out. I'm going to come back tomorrow. And then you would go back tomorrow. Uh, somebody took it out again or they didn't return it, you know, and you would ask the clerk and they would be like, please leave me alone. I'm working at yeah. Blockbuster. I don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> it was a completely um, different universe. Mm -hmm. So it, it it really required a level of of dedication and, and nerdiness and passion that, um, you know, you don't necessarily need these days. Nowadays, if there's a movie like that, odds are. You can watch it right now. You might be able to watch it without standing up. You, you know what I mean? You can watch it by clicking a few buttons, per perhaps. Um, uh, possibly without spending a dime if it's on one of the services you already pay for. So, yes, they they and the show were absolutely sort of the thing that first inspired me and then went to film school for a while and studied and had several incredibly lucky things happen to me, which, you know, is not exciting to hear when somebody is going, well, how do you do this? And yeah, you know, dumb luck is a big part of it. So um, that's never an exciting answer, but it's an honest one in my case. So yeah, it's a sort of a combination of all those things. Um, two things. One, I assume growing up in New Jersey, if you're trying to get a, a lesser known film, I assumed you were only allowed to watch clerks. If you're from New Jersey, like, is that a rule? <laughs> I did watch, you know, look, you can, we can, you can poke fun, but that he's actually, Kevin Smith is actually from not far from where I grew up. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, 
I spent a summer in Boston, my between, I guess, between junior and senior year of high school. And one of the very first nights I was there, there was a like an indie theater, mm-hmm. a cool theater, unlo- the likes of which I, I very rarely had seen in my life to that point. And they were showing Chasing Amy. And here was a movie about people who made comic books, who were mm-hmm. cool, who had relationships with the opposite gender, who <laughs> spoke, you know, eloquently but amusingly um that was like a side and and was a movie i had seen recommended i might add on siskel and ebert it was like it was it was like a bomb going off in my mind it was unbelievable and 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 then i watched clerks and more and then that was it so i watched a lot of kevin smith growing up i'm not ashamed to say that I poke fun, but Kevin Smith is genuinely my favorite director. Chasing Amy might be my favorite movie of all time. You want to talk about movies you could do from start to end? Like, I could still do Chasing Amy. Like, what's a newbie in? Like, I could literally do Chasing Amy. There was a while when I was in high school and had a girlfriend that I thought I was head over heels in love. I could, like, do the whole Ben Affleck super cheesy, like, speech that he does in the car. So I, I poke fun, but I adore Kevin Smith. And I, uh, Listen, I like same thing with Dogma. I could do all of his movies, like even his actively cheesy and bad horror movies. Listen, I still love Tusk, and I will I'll defend it to anyone who wants to talk about it. Um, you mentioned Siskel and Ebert. Like, what made you want to write about them and like tell a story about these people who, for most of the public, might you know they, they obviously everyone knows two thumbs up, but like they might not know how you know they really didn't like each other for a long time. And like, they knew each other, like they were pretty well known, you know, one-on-one of Pulitzer, like before they'd ever decided to work together. Like what made you want to dig into their lives and their relationship and, and everything they've meant to pop culture? It really uh, came down to my love of the show and, you know, wanting I honestly like I wanted to uh, read this book. I, and and at a certain point, it's like if you want to read it, you might have to write it kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, that was why I've always felt like there should be a book about this. And, you know, certainly Roger Ebert, uh, a, a, a hero of mine and a great writer, wrote a lot of amazing books. I have a whole Roger Ebert shelf on my bookshelf in my place. Um, And he wrote a great memoir, but his memoir life itself, it's not the Siskel and Ebert story. You know, it's a, however many hundreds of pages in that book, there's three chapters about Siskel and Ebert. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not about this. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very much, you know, that's a a part of his life, but in the book, that book, it's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just felt like there was room for this book to exist. And so, uh, you know, after I had written other things and I was looking for something to do next and was kind of batting around topics, um, I made a a list that I was supposed to show to my literary agent Mm -hmm. and I showed it to my wife first. And she was like looking at it and going, well, where is Siskel and Ebert? Because it was not on the list at first. And she knows me and my insanities. And so she correctly assessed that it at least should be in the discussion. And I had I told her that, um, you know, the honest truth was that I was, in you know, a little intimidated to write a book about it because the show means so much to me. Gene and Roger were such great critics and writers. And how do you write this and not invite these comparisons yeah. to them and to their work? And her response was, you know, stop being a dope, stop being yourself uh, and get over yourself. And if anyone else does it, you're going to be pissed off that you Mm -hmm. didn't. And, uh, you know, spite is a really powerful motivator, anger and rage. And, um, and she was right. And that was, and so it wound up on the list and that was the, that was the topic. And, um, and she, and she was right. I mean, I, 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 it was something that I would, I would love to do. And I'm really happy with the results. And, um, uh, I'm glad it uh, that this book now exists for everyone to read, not just not just for me. So I, I'm always always curious when talking to people who have written biographies. Uh, you know, how did you go about your research process? And these two people that obviously you had a lot of knowledge in, but like you know, to write something like this, you have to really get into the nitty gritty. So like, can you kind of take me through your? And speaking of nerdy questions, like I know this is a nerdy one, but like I genuinely am always fascinated by like where does one go to find like 
intimate and like nuanced details about Siskel and Ebert. Right. Well, I mean, part of it was interviewing, you know, people who knew them, worked mm-hmm. with them, friends, loved ones, co-workers. That's a big part of it, certainly, because unfortunately, you know, neither one is alive now. So mm-hmm. I can't talk to them. Um, getting their voice into the book as much as or voices as much as I could was was another big part of the research, which was, you know, they did a lot of interviews um, yeah. during their career. And so it was a lot of, you know. Online research, libraries, uh, you know, finding people who had treasure troves of articles about them and, you know, trying to hunt down as many places. eBay was actually a really useful Mm -hmm. place where I found some random things that probably I would not have found otherwise. I found this one issue of uh, Culver Military Academy alumni magazine which Gene Siskel went to this military academy and in the either the very late seventies or very early eighties, he, they did a profile on him Mm -hmm. and it's very long and has a lot of his, his, uh, his biography is in there. It has him talking about how he got his job, what he likes to do, his passions, his interests, all these kind of things, which I've never, there's, I've never seen this anywhere else. It just was fortunate that I found it Somebody was selling their, God only knows why they didn't want to keep their copy of Culver alumni (laughs) magazine issue number 45 forever and ever, but someone was getting rid of it and they put it on eBay and I was able to grab it. And it turned out to be an incredible resource. And I found a few other things like that, where they were just Mm -hmm. random articles and random magazines and newspapers where you, you, you know, sometimes you would, I'd buy something on eBay and I'd look at it and go, well, this isn't all that useful. And then there were other times where I was like, this is fantastic. So Mm -hmm. it really was about casting a really wide net and trying to find as many sources as I could find and going through all of them, cataloging all of them, and then seeing, okay, well, what do I have? What do I need? What can I supplement by talking to people? Who can I talk to? And, um, and yeah, and then the last element of the research was watching the show, watching as mm-hmm. much of the show as I possibly could. Was there any, and you, I, you don't have to give like the funniest or best details away. People got to read the book to do that. But were there any things that you discovered about them that you were just like, holy shit, I, I had no idea about X, Y, or Z. You're like, huh, that's, that's pretty wild or interesting. From the show or about them? Uh, about them specifically. I mean, there were certainly... You know, some things. I mean, obviously, as a, a mega dork about the show and these guys, I, there was there was a lot that I, I was already pretty familiar with. But there were times where I'd be like, where ha, where of what rabbit hole have I fallen down? Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things I did not know about, which I was very excited to find out about, was that they once invented a, a pizza, the Siskel and Ebert pizza. Oh. They attempted to revolutionize the food industry as they had revolutionized the film criticism world. They were doing an interview, I believe, with Vanity Fair magazine, Mm -hmm. and they were doing it at a pizza place in Chicago. I think it's called Father and Son, or it was called Father and Son. I'm not sure. It was still around until recently. I think it may have closed just in the last few years or changed names, changed hands, something. And they were talking about pizza because they were doing an interview in a pizza place. And they started riffing about, wouldn't it be great if there was a pizza where if if it had, imagine, uh, visualize a donut and then visualize a donut as a pizza, where the shape is a, is a donut. There's a hole in the middle of the pizza. So it's, they were like, wouldn't it be great if there was crust on the outside and the inside of pizza? And then they had the the pizza place make up one, and mm-hmm. supposedly they did sell it for a little while. And it had a couple of, I mean, it was like the double crust pizza or the double mm-hmm. ring pizza. That's wild. When have you ever heard someone say, "You know what I would like to have more of on this pizza <laughs> is crust"? <laughs> Again, as the as the uh, as a parent of two small children, I never have to fend off desperate pleas for more crust from my. Dad, can I have more crust? I just love the crust. So the fact yeah. that they they not only created their own pizza, that they thought the way to go about it was yeah. to do this thing that no one else had done, which was to make a double ring pizza. That truly was a mind blowing moment in my life. Yeah. Listen, I'll never be the same. There's a reason that we dog owners call crust pizza bones. It's because they, those are the that's the part you give to the dog. That's you right. Know, 
If I want crust, I'll just eat bread. Not according to Siskel and Ebert. They they love the crust. Give them the crust. (laughs) Uh, How would you say, other than the obvious, like the fact that they made it much more apparent that this could be a thing you could do? Like, how do you think their influence, since you had such a, a, a joy and love of the show, like, how do you think they have affected the way that you critique films? I think the main way was that, you know, again, when I was watching the show really obsessively in, in as a as a in middle school through high school was when I was uh, really watching the show mm-hmm. was they had a way of making everything feel accessible um and they were and they were very inclus- inclusive mm-hmm. they ne- you never watched the show and felt you know like oh I'm not smart enough to watch this I'm not up enough on that they they didn't they were not snobs yeah you know and they could speak very intelligently and eloquently and passionately about very obscure uh very you know artsy fartsy movies quite frankly Mm -hmm. but they could do it in a way that made you want to see the movie if if they thought it was good obviously they did not they made these things seem accessible Mm -hmm. and um that was absolutely part of the appeal was they would they would talk about these movies and I would go, I want to see that. And then I would see it and go, this is good. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would encourage people to see things, you know, in a way they're encouraging me. I'm speaking me personally. They were encouraging me to see things outside that comfort zone of dumb comedies that I like, you know, try mm-hmm. something from France or from Spain or from England. Try something that cost a hundred thousand dollars and mm-hmm. has no special effects and doesn't have uh you know bill murray in it or whatever it is and i i would hope if i'm doing anything right uh as a film critic myself it's trying to uh, approach things that way is i don't want i never want someone to be reading what i'm writing and thinking what the hell is this guy talking about because i, I certainly have read some <laughs> Uh, film writers and critics in my day going to school and studying cinema where it can, it can be, it can be a slog. Mm -hmm. And even if they have insightful things to say, they're doing it a way that can be kind of distancing and, um, or almost like they're aiming to go over your head. They're trying to prove how smart they are. So that, if I if I've taken anything from from Siskel and Ebert, it would hopefully I'm trying to take that and and that you know that I don't expect anyone to come to something I've written or a podcast or whatever it is and to know everything like mm-hmm. that would if you know everything why am I why are you reading it you're coming to discover to learn to have a good experience perhaps to want to see this movie perhaps to maybe you've already seen it and you just want another perspective. You want to see hear what I saw in it, maybe to get a deeper understanding. So that that's what I would say. I'm hopefully I learned from them and hopefully I'm aiming for in, in the stuff that I do. So I, my day job is in marketing specifically for tech. And I, my partner will get annoyed with me because I will 100% every time if we're watching like a TV show or a football game and a commercial comes on, I will be like, that's awful messaging. Like, and she'll be like, I get it. Yep. So I, I can't turn it off. And I'm wondering if you as a film critic, are you able to kind of turn off your critic brain ever when you're watching movies that you aren't watching for review purposes? Like, are you able just to kind of sit there and see something at, at face value? Or are you, is it kind of, you're like that, the cinematography and this is kind of garbage or X, Y, Z. <laughs> Uh, so are you asking like, am I de- completely dead inside or do I have some semblance of a soul that can be well, touched and moved by the magic of cinema? Yeah, that's a more direct way. Of yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm dead inside. No, uh, <laughs> I mean, I I, I I hesitate to ever and I'm not getting upset that you said it, but like I'm always wary of anyone who ever says like, you know, turn your brain off yeah. about anything, mm-hmm. um, including movies, because to me. That's not a really a fun way to enjoy anything, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, or if you have to turn your brain off to enjoy something, how good could it possibly be? You know, like that's a defense you sometimes hear about, like those events movies we were we talked about earlier. It's like, well, what did you think of it? Well, it was I thought it was pretty bad. It was a piece of junk. What did you Mm -hmm. think? Oh, you know, if you turn your brain off, it was, you know, and it's like. Well, shouldn't we aspire to live in a world where we can enjoy something big and spectacular that's Mm -hmm. also doesn't insult our our intelligence so i i will say 
you know, I I watch a ton of stuff with my kids. It's one of my favorite parts about having kids is introducing them to things that I love or I loved as a kid, introducing mm-hmm. things I like now, seeing their reactions. And it is interesting to see things through their eyes. Yeah. Um, because they they're they're not dead inside like I am. So, you know, seeing the way, you know, for example, my my older daughter loves home alone. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a movie I would say is a bad movie, may have gotten yeah. two thumbs down from Siskel and Ebert, as a matter of fact, but it was not one I would necessarily give a thumbs down. Mm-hmm. I just would think yeah, it's a, it's a, I, I liked it when I was a kid. It was a funny movie. But to see it, watch how hard it makes her laugh. Yeah. It does make you appreciate it on some level that mm-hmm. um, even if you are dead inside, that you can see the joy that it's giving to this seven, eight year old kid. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a really special thing. And I'm, I'm very glad that I get to witness moments like that. That's awesome. Um, what is, I got two more questions for you. One, you mentioned home alone, but like, what is something that you have reintroduced to your kids that, that does, let's, let's spin it positive. That, that does still kind of hold its own. And you're like, oh man, this really stood the test of time. What, what's something again, other than home alone, obviously, which I agree is still a wonderful movie. What's something that You've shown them and like as you were watching it with them, in addition to seeing it through their eyes, you were like, man, I really I still enjoy this. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the movies we we watch together, I think, are really great. You know, I, I, Ghostbusters was one of the first movies I think we talked about today. I mm-hmm. My older daughter loves Ghostbusters and we've watched now every Ghostbusters movie and a lot of real Ghostbusters cartoons because she got so into it when I showed it to her. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that movie is still... The the conversation around those movies doesn't always entertain me these days, but the movie itself, I think, really stands the test of time. I love um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the Gene Wilder version. I loved that as a kid and rewatching it um, with my kids. I think I probably liked it more than they even did, yeah. where I was like, this is a just a fabulous movie and it feels so the humor in it really to me in a way feels kind of ahead of its time. It reminds me like the humor in it of like the Simpsons yeah. the style of quick cutting away from jokes and the really dry humor of it mm-hmm. and the the satire of, of media and, and that sort of stuff. I think that movie holds up really, really well. Um, so there's, there's two examples for you of movies that my kids like um, and I like just as much or more than they do. Beautiful. Um, all right. I have last question for you. I usually ask the author who's come on to give a recommendation of any kind. I'm going to make, I'm going to pigeonhole you and, and spin it around into your book. What is a movie you have seen recently that you would give two thumbs up? Do you think people should check out? Well, I, uh, I recently saw the new Martin Scorsese movie, mm-hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. And here, here's a, here's a hot take for you. Here's, this is going to scorch up the internet. Stand back. Martin Scorsese is a good director. That Whoa. guy knows. Yeah, I know. I know. Calm down. I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm I've lost it. I'm just going to say, I'm just letting it all out there. That guy is good. That guy knows what he's doing. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen so already before a lot of people have even seen it, these ridiculous takes. It's too long. It's, it's Scorsese. He says these mean things about Marvel movies. How dare he? And I say this as someone who loves Marvel movies. I wrote a book about Spider-Man. Come on, people. Yeah. This movie is incredible. It is It is long. It's three and a half hours, but it is an uh, just a profound and moving and beautiful and heartbreaking and eye-opening three and a half hours. And uh, when it was over, I could have watched another hour. And the last scene of this movie is so good, and I would never think of spoiling it, but just the last few moments of this movie are incredible and honestly like made me weep. I mean, mm-hmm. it is unbelievable. So uh, that is a movie that I would give multiple fingers and toes up. I would encourage people to see, um, you know, judge it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it's an incredible movie. Perfect. Well, speaking of incredible things, Posable Thumbs is such a phenomenal book. I was so excited to get to talk to you about it as a, a, a film dork myself. This is just Wonderful conversation. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell.
Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts.